So we call this the NIH 101 session, everything you need to know for, for obvious reasons. And of course, this just lays the groundwork for your own individual scenarios and questions that are not going to be answered by what we present. But I think we give you kind of a cultural immersion here that would be difficult for you to pick up uh, simply on your own from a website <coughs> and reading NIH announcements and the like. So, without further ado, uh, congratulations, gratitude, and kudos uh, to the following parties. Firstly, uh, to our uh, ASHA colleagues, uh, headed by uh, Margaret Rogers and capable team of, of associates for doing the Lessons for Success conference so successfully uh, for many years. Uh, the reviews the, uh, of this particular conference grant, which is a U13 or a cooperative conference grant, uh, have been absolutely spectacular. Um, the kind of reviews you'd, you know, you'd like to showcase on your own personal homepage uh, and hang up on your wall, and there's a reason for that. It's, it's a, a wonderful uh, team effort for all participants, the planning committee, uh, of course, the participants. Uh, gratitude to the mentors and presenters for giving of your time, and there's a lot of time, travel, preparation, doing your reviews and contributing to forging the independent career trajectories of you and the audience, very promising uh, individuals, uh, and uh, we're really delighted to be co-funding this together with Ash and Ash the Foundation. So, uh, this is a slide I love to show. Uh, it's directly from Margaret's grant application, frankly, uh, reflecting uh, ASHA's survey data uh, and outcomes of the Lessons for Success uh, protégés. Uh, this gives you uh, a breakdown uh, of who you are. Uh, this has been fairly consistent uh, with about half of you junior level faculty members, typically assistant professors, uh, and the other half divided between doctoral students, postdoctoral fellows, uh, and the like. Uh, and we found that within two years of participation, uh, almost 40% of you have applied for NIH funding. And look at this, 94% of those who have applied uh, to the NIH or other federal agency or ASHA foundation have won an award. That's absolutely astounding. Uh, so overall, of all the participants, the success rate uh, that was tracked in the past that Margaret presented was 39%. Uh, and five years post Lessons for Success participation, this meeting is happening well over a decade now, 97% of, per, uh, of attendees at this meeting uh, have held academic or non-academic research positions. That's pretty incredible. It really is and uh, serves as uh, uh, a showpiece for the organizers uh, and um, a model for other uh, agencies and uh, professional societies to follow. So here's my plan. First, we want to tell you something, uh, and this is kind of motivational in flavor, of launching an NIH-funded independent research career, the challenges, the rewards. Uh, we'll give you an introduction to extramural NIH and NIDCD, bearing in mind that NIH is two different worlds that do not much intersect, and that is intramural NIH and extramural. We're talking extramural NIH in the main here. We'll give, tell you more about that. Uh, then we'll go on to starting out the game uh, with individual fellowships, pre-doctoral, post-doctoral, with an emphasis on post-doc fellowships because most of you are past the point of your doctoral students of applying for a dissertation stage award. Uh, but postdocs should be within your sights and consideration. Uh, we'll talk about mentored junior level K awards, career development awards, and uh, uh, applicable research project grants for the new investigator. And I'm always struggling to leave time for questions at the end, but I will be pretty light on individual slides. I will try. Okay, so this is the you come here basically with the expectation and the fear that uh, how do you get NIH funding? The waters are really rough. Uh, it's, it's a very difficult task uh, to prevail in this struggle. 
However, your sailing is a good deal smoother if you come as an informed con consumer. Firstly, having great grant ideas, that's the purpose of Lessons for Success, uh, as well as continually learning, it's a lifelong process, uh, improving your grant writing skills and my role and the role of my colleagues is largely to give you some real initiation to the NIH system. Uh, to be a scientist is to be detail-oriented. Reading NIH announcements carefully, uh, as well as application instructions, before you pick up the phone or send an email to one of us to ask your questions, but asking those questions that inevitably you leave those documents with a puzzled feeling because you're going to have questions. And of course, building your endurance to stay the course, um, even if the waters are somewhat rough at times. Even seasoned investigators have had those rough waters almost inevitably. What are your keys to success? Uh, your mentored research training, you need to take full advantage of that. You've got to have the right type of proposal with significance, innovation, obviously scientific and technical merit, your commitment and tenacity to the goal of becoming uh, a researcher or a clinician researcher needs to be absolutely ironclad as well as your tenacity needs to be fairly unshakable and your grant writing skills need to be continually refined. These are the people who are in this game and, and generally do prevail. What are the facts of life for this type of lifestyle? Obviously, keen competition for grant support, whether you're talking NIH or other funding agencies. Funding levels uh, tend not, not to vary a great deal. They're fairly constant or often diminishing over the years. There's always uncertainty in our world with respect to a federal agency. We're completely dependent on Congress, President, for our budget. Indeed, this next fiscal year, 2015, shares the uncertainty of other years and indeed is very likely to be flat, namely no budgetary increases this coming fiscal year beginning October 1, likely relative to the current fiscal year. That's not cast in stone. It could change, but that's our conservative uh, projection. Uh, however, on positive side, today's NIH is getting more and more new investigator friendly. We're even friendly towards seasoned investigators, as evidenced by a surprise announcement uh, to most of us on April 17th that you're no longer restricted to an original NIH application and one resubmission revision. Indeed, you can put in yet another application duplicating or significantly overlapping your previous one, and it's reviewed as a new application. Uh, that is investigator-friendly. Uh, bear in mind that the best prepared and the most tenacious applicants generally compete successfully, even in the toughest of times. I like speaking to a communication sciences and disorders crowd uh, because we can speak about the pool of trained scientists uh, is simply not keeping pace with the, the burgeoning scientific opportunities. Uh, notice that over 100 uh, research doctoral degrees in speech-language pathology and audiology uh, are issued. Uh, a small number of these people, to our dismay, go on for postdoctoral training, even those that have strong aptitude and research interests, uh, and it's higher in other fields, so we want to encourage our best and brightest, we look to you, uh, to consider postdoctoral research training, uh, even for a year or two, ideally two years or even more. Uh, and note that uh, there are open faculty positions out there in CSD type departments if you're willing to travel uh, and uh, take an, in, an intake type of, of, of faculty position at the, at the front end with the expectation of maybe moving to a more research-intensive environment uh, as, as you're building your career. Clearly, clinician investigators are crucial translators of scientific advances. NIH certainly is brought into this. I think Congress has uh, as well. Uh, 
and uh, your role as a clinically trained scientist, uh, be you an otologist, an audiologist, a speech-language pathologist, can be as a PI principal investigator, a substantive co-investigator, or what are often called team scientists, who don't lead a research effort, but are substantively contributing towards its success, and obviously co-authors, maybe even first authors on publications emerging there from that effort, and of course, chairs of department, directors of research, uh, deputy chairs, vice chairs, play a critical role in the overall academic research enterprise. NIDCD uh, has some special provisions, even beyond NIH Central, uh, for new and emerging investigators. You may be aware of several of you are having experience with the NIDCD R3 or small grant program. This is specifically for transitioning postdoctoral fellows and new faculty member investigators. It's different from the NIH-wide R03 program. Furthermore, uh, I'm delighted to tell you, if you don't know already, that uh, our institute, the NIDCD, uh, is one of the few at the NIH that personally ourselves do the fellowship reviews, our division of uh, uh, our, our scientific review branch does them in an expedited fashion. Indeed, later on we'll introduce some members of our, our review staff as well as program staff to you. It's a team effort, and that process is expedited to the point uh, that from when you put in your application to the funding decision to actually getting funding, if you're so fortunate, can be as short as four to five months. The beauty of that is it enables you to, first of all, get going as the clock is ticking in your career at a critical juncture, and also, if necessary, revise and resubmit your fellowship application if easily upgradable for the next uh, submission date without skipping a round of the three uh, submission rounds per year. So that's a special provision we make. Um, we also have a provision for uh, individuals who are ESIs or early stage investigator R01 applicants, as well as junior mentored K award applicants like K08 and K23 awardees to submit a letter of response to the summary statement critiques which we consume at the staff level and we put in front of our institute's advisory council, uh, which meets three times a year, for consideration of funding, even if your score may be considered in somewhat of the gray zone for funding. There's not actually a, f a funding cutoff that we have for, for fellowships and K awards, uh, but obviously scores do matter. Uh, Furthermore, your early stage investigator ESI or NI is new investigator status is considered uh, at the second level of review at the council level, at the training board level for fellowships. Uh, and typically, we do not reduce, administratively reduce the budgets of new investigators uh, or uh, early stage investigators and certainly not K awardees and fellows who are getting it a small enough um, amount generally to begin with. Okay, uh, and of course, uh, what I mentioned beforehand, and that should be 417, my error, uh, NIH uh, Central has just uh, broadened its policy to allow uh, individuals who are unsuccessful in their one allowable revised application resubmission to submit as a new investigator. This is a, an important development. Okay, so uh, I wanted to kind of open quickly, and I think this is encouraging information, to show you, uh, focusing on the column on the right of fiscal year 2013, the last full fiscal year we have data on, just to show you firstly our budget as an institute, 417 million, uh, the success rate of our Fs or fellowships, this is across pre and post docs, is about 40% or so. Our K99 R00, which is a two-phase K award for seasoned postdoctoral fellows, uh, has been coming up, actually, to about 35% relative to earlier years. Uh, our R03 success rate is holding currently at about 30%. Uh, 
These are this is the ratio of applications funded to those reviewed. And our R01 success rate is 26%. Again, averaging across initial applications and revised applications. This is pretty good news. I mean, this is pretty solid. You've got a real chance there if you've got the right stuff and you heed the advice given at this conference and really follow through and network and do all those positive things. So that's meant to encourage you despite the challenges, uh, despite the rough waters, because many people uh, in the Navy do survive you know, rough waters, and, and you want to be among them. And there's no such thing as a poor Navy pilot. You've only got good pilots, and you've got better than good pilots. So you want to be in, in the higher echelons in order to, to prevail in this system. So what are your challenges? Your challenges are significant, and they are many. You're, you depend on federal grant support. You, of course, depend on that not only to get funded, but also for promotion and tenure, to build your lab, your own career. You need constantly, and the seasoned folks in the audience will testify to this, to be always, during your working life, writing new grant applications. And don't be in a situation where you've got great ideas but just can't find the time. Time management skills are critical. You're under pressure to publish, preferably in high-impact journals. And of course, uh, across academia, uh, your net worth and promotionary potential it can be pretty closely tied to your ability to bring in extramural grant support, particularly federal support. What are your core competencies? You need to be absolutely passionate about what you're doing. You can't imagine yourself doing anything else. Uh, you're developing novel and compelling research ideas. You stay doggedly focused in the short term and in the long range on what your goals are and you structure your life so that you can pursue those without significant interruption. Uh, you build in the needed training that you need. You constantly network, build scientific writing proposals. Uh, you understand your literature, your background literature, your field very well, particularly the leaders, the camps, and the controversies. Um, it is very disheartening when we get a fellowship or a K award application that comes in without an understanding of the requisite background literature, and it's even more disheartening when you're in a hotly contested area of scientific inquiry, uh, and indeed your reviewer may well be from the other camp, so you see the dangers therein. Stay cautious, stay conservative, stay informed. You proactively, every single day, want to stay informed on funding opportunities. You need to subscribe and check at least on a once-a-week basis. I would suggest two to three times a week the NIH guide because announcements, notices, funding opportunities constantly go into it. You want to actively network. That's one of the reasons you're here and getting to know each other and your, your mentors here. Uh, you want to build your... Uh, inner core so that you can uh, be tenacious uh, without being abusive uh, and, and, uh, uh, and prepare for criticism and even rejection. It's not personal. And even if it is, you're stronger than that. And you want to write applications directed not just to one funding source, but to several. You want to diversify your assets because you never know when one uh, funding source is going to dry up, fall through, uh, so you need uh, a soft landing strategy. You need to be networked. So th these are just some you know, pearls of wisdom that we've dealt with over so many years and picked up, and they're certainly not unique to the NIH, but they are very generalizable. Uh, so if you want to be a clinician researcher, you need to get mentored. Uh, scientists, the literature has shown, who have effective mentors tend to allocate more time to research over their careers. They complete projects to fulfillment. They publish them. They're more successful in gaining uh, grant uh, awards. Uh, so, uh, again, my pitch. If you're a doctoral student thinking about what to do next, you may have a faculty position opportunity. Obviously, you have bills to pay. You may have family responsibilities. Life is complex and multifaceted. 
but strongly consider doing two years of postdoc training. Uh, if, if you at all can, you, you will not regret it. Uh, furthermore, apply for mentoring programs. Uh, we have uh, NIH-funded institutional training grants called T32s in addition to individual fellowships. And then, of course, there are mentorship programs as the ASHA Pathways Program, uh, which is kind of a sister program to this and the overall uh, ASHA system of research mentoring. Uh, and we're delighted to have three guests coming from the uh, Duke University uh, mentoring program that we're also supporting there. And of course, this conference, the Lessons for Success, the ASHA SIPRI program, all provide you with different opportunities to obtain research mentoring. Uh, one or more of those will be appropriate to you. Okay, so now uh, let's back up, uh, change gears, and speak about what the NIH is. Again, known to most of you, but just to cover the basic groundwork, the National Institutes of Health is the nation's primary steward for support of health-related biomedical behavioral research. We are a vast organization, 27 institutes and centers, 24 of them make uh, grant awards, and of course our mission, most holistically, is to promote human health, reduce the burden of disease, and the like. As I mentioned earlier, NIH has two worlds, two biospheres, if you will, extramural research, which we represent, uh, that is in order to promote and fund research to two to 3,000 academic and non-academic research institutions, primarily in the U.S., but a few abroad as well, and our intramural research program. This afternoon, you're going to hear from uh, a very impressive intramural and NIDCD researcher by the name of Dr. Lisa Cunningham, uh, who will charge you up and how to prepare to write an R01 application. And, and Lisa uh, is an intramural researcher, namely she does research within the NIH, uh, the NIDCD intramural research program, which is now, her laboratory is now on the main campus, it used to be just down the street from here for years and years. So NIDCD, National Institute on Deafness and Other Communication Disorders, and we were born by an act of Congress in 1988 to be the primary NIH supporter of seven research areas, hearing, balance, that's, by the way, both vestibular and non-vestibular uh, uh, contributors to human balance control, uh, smell, taste, those are the special senses that, got, that we inherited from our prior home in the Neurology Institute, and, of course, voice, speech, and language. So human communication plus the special senses of taste and smell. And we're all about normal and disordered processes and everything connected to that. Uh, for fiscal year 13, uh, our breakdown, and this has been quite stable over the years, uh, 50 to 60 percent of our dollars and grants are in the hearing area, um, 5 to 7 percent in balance. Smell and taste is about 60 and 17 and uh, about 25% in voice, speech, and language. This, is, by the way, is not uh, by act of Congress or even determined locally within the Institute of the NIH uh, Director's Office. These are not allocations. This reflects the applications we get and the awards we make. So you, the scientific community, are the drivers. But this has been remarkably stable over now many years. Uh, to sensitize you, uh, NIDCD is not the only awarding component of the 24 institutes and centers that make grant awards at the NIH that supports CSD-related research. Indeed, uh, a uh, valued colleague of ours, uh, Dr. Lisa Freund, will be here for the lunchtime session, or perhaps a little before, from the uh, Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute of Child Health and Human Development, NICHD, uh, and we'll distinguish NIDCD and NICHD with respect to language research in a little while. Who supports what? National Institute on Edge Aging, uh, NINDS, National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke, where we used to be a, a division before we were born in 88, uh, National Institute of Dental and Craniofacial Research. These are 
the most common institutes that interface with communication sciences and disorders with, and our other mission areas. So we're not the only game in town. The NIDCD research mission in human language and communication is primarily in the disordered domain. So disordered speech perception, phonology, language is subserved by the NIDCD. Language of the hard of hearing and the deaf. The deaf. Also, uh, language and communication functions uh, in uh, autism spectrum disorders, ASD, is also primarily within our purview responsibility voice, swallowing, and speech production in health and disease, alternative augmentative communication modalities, computer-assisted and otherwise, uh, are also primarily supported by the NIDCD. Research and, and swallowing and dysphagia uh, is funded by more institutes than the NIDCD. Uh, and every individual proposal needs to come to us for consideration about what the most appropriate home will be. Contrasted to the NICHD, the Child Health Institute, which Lisa will tell you more about during the lunch session, uh, which is primarily focused on the more normative, typically developing aspects of language, reading and writing uh, from infancy and adulthood, uh, and um, atypical development of language and communication in mental retardation and developmental disabilities, normative speech production, uh, literacy, reading disabilities, and related learning disabilities are also primarily within the NICHD domain. And finally, bilingualism, second language acquisition is also an NICHD fund. So you can see that if you're in the normal, normative language arena, you're going to want to speak to us and to the NICHD before you put in that fellowship uh, application, that K award, thinking that you're going to go to one institute because maybe indeed we would send you to the other institutes. So you want to touch base with relevant NIH staff in both institutes before being certain where your application is going to go and directing it there and even be influenced by the funding priorities uh, and scope of the institute where you want your application to be assigned to. Okay, so funding mechanisms at the NIH is an alphabet soup of activity codes, F31s, K23s, RL1s. Uh, your general rule is if that alphanumeric begins with an R, it's a research grant. If it begins with an F, it's a fellowship, a T, is an institutional training grant, uh, and a K, of course, is a career development award. Bear in mind that NIH, as much unity as we want to present in front of the public at large or Congress, uh, we are truly a, a complex organization of somewhat different, albeit overlapping, fiefdoms. Uh, we use mechanisms somewhat differently. We use different mechanisms. We have you know, different ways of interpreting. We have different funding levels. You need to be speaking to the institute or institutes that you're interested in and get to know its internal culture. And that's another reason that we take so much time to speak to you, to kind of sensitize you to those. Okay? Uh, your primary source of information on NIH initiatives and notices is the all-important NIH guide. FOAs, funding opportunity announcements, there are notices, there are requests for applications. It needs to be required reading, at least scanning, at least once a week. I would suggest two to three times a week because the clock starts ticking and there may be only 60 days to apply for a given targeted earmarked initiative, sometimes even less. Um, and you need a lot of time to put together a strong NIH application. It is important that you direct your application to the institute or funding agency that will optimize your chances where the match is best and that you pick the right mechanism, uh, grant mechanism, funding mechanism for your career stage for the purposes you're after. Uh, there are even seasoned investigators 
that haven't quite gotten uh, this one down uh, when they serve as mentors for their, their youngsters. So it's important to come up to speed on this as quickly as you can with the cognizance that NIH is a fast-changing, dynamic place, and things can change. And people who were informed about NIH practice and policies five, ten years ago are most likely not up to speed on what the current scene is. You really need to be at the cutting edge of NIH as it evolves in its complex journey. So before submitting an application, you want to consult the relevant PO, that's your NIH program officer, make sure that proposal is appropriate to that institute's research mission. Don't make that tacit assumption. I actually ask fellowship and K-award applicants to send me a draft specific aims page. It takes time to go through them, but this way at least we can be more confident that indeed this proposal is appropriately directed and assigned to our institute and if it, if it scores well, we can fund it without any uh, hesitation and, and um, second classing in terms of a scientific priority or not. We want to treat all applications in a level playing field type of manner. So you, you are important to that, practice, that initial triage of is my application being directed to the proper institute. And bear in mind that in today's NIH, you can deal with more than one institute. Typically, often, your proposal is assigned to one primary assignee institute and one or more secondary or tertiary assignee institutes as well. Uh, if, and you have some real say in today's NIH in where it's assigned to on the basis of putting in a covering letter, making that request. If in your covering letter you can say, I am making this request on the basis of having consulted the training officer, the program officer in Institute X, who told me that this is within the NIH, uh, th that institute's mission, uh, it is very likely that the Center for Scientific Review referral officer will grant your request. Uh, if it's an NIDCD uh, directed fellowship, we have uh, fellowship frequency, a frequently asked questions uh, pay a document that I think is quite informative. Uh, stay informed, subscribe to the guide, and above all, and Lisa Cunningham will drive home this message as I could never, uh, with the fervor and the personal experience, start early. Speed is the enemy of quality. Think in terms of a 12-month, would you believe, lead time for a full-blown R01 and at least four to six months for smaller types of applications from conceiving of the idea to producing the application. You also, before submitting, want to make sure that you make friends and register with uh, your institutional grants office uh, so that you're registered with the NIH ERA Commons, very important. Obviously, carefully read and consume our uh, funding opportunity announcements as well as the statements of individual institutes you're interested in, which will be in Section 7 at the end of NIH-wide program announcements if a number of institutes participate in them. Because again, different institutes have different priorities, provisions, uh, and modes of interpretation, even eligibility criteria on some mechanisms. You want to write an original application, not a cut and paste from your mentor's application. Indeed, uh, the current NIH fellowship guidelines uh, state now more succinctly than ever that your proposal must be sufficiently distinct from your sponsor or mentor's research program and, of course, appropriate for your career stage. So just because you're working on your mentor's R01 uh, and your mentor is more than happy to turn over one, of, one or more of his or her specific aims to you for a fellowship, for a K award, does not mean that you should cut and paste it into your application. It needs to have originality to it. It needs to be yours, albeit under the, the guidance of your sponsor and mentor. Okay. 
Now let's talk about who we are, the diversity among us. Vive la différence. We have basically three types of individuals in the NIH extramural world. We have the program officer, we have uh, the review officer, scientific review officer, we have the grants management specialist or officer. What are the roles and responsibilities that you need to know about? Program officer deals with pre-submission questions and post-review questions. Your application was reviewed. You don't have a summary statement yet. You want to hear how it fared, especially if it got scored, where we'll have, we hopefully have attended the review. Uh, and post-award scientific management of grants is done by the program officer. Uh, I neglected to say here that overall running of a scientific program and research initiatives also uh, come from the PO or program officer. Uh, the scientific review officer uh, handles your pre-review, post-submission questions, uh, makes reviewer assignments, convenes and runs the review meeting, guides it according to NIH guidelines, uh, and generates the summary statement. Once the summary statement is generated, you default back to the program officer in general for questions and concerns. Grants management specialist is actually the official government uh, person who is empowered and responsible for making grant awards. Uh, they're the ones who are officially responsible to NIH fiscal management policy. They activate your award. They manage it fiscally. They terminate it. Uh, so they are a very important per person in your life. Uh, they could be construed as your parent in the sense they begin your life and they <laughs> see you through their lifetime at least. Uh, and of course, award compliance and NIH administrative requirements are monitored by the grants management officer. So we're a very interactive group, especially in a small institute like the NIDCD. We constantly talk to each other, interact, uh, and get along generally like a happy family. OK, now moving on to our next topic uh, is NIDCD, and this largely reflects the overall NIH, research training and career development uh, mechanisms. There are two different subcategories. There are the Ruth L. Kirstein, former famed director of the NIH uh, and director of the National Institute of General Medical Sciences for many years, who was an extremely big training advocate. Uh, so the RLK National Research Service Award, or NRSAs, and they come in two flavors, individual fellowships, pre-doc and post-doc, and institutional training grants, T32s, T35s. In the case of individual fellowships, you, the applicant, apply directly to the NIH. In the case of institutional training grants, you don't apply to the NIH. You apply to the funded program director at that institutional training grant. NIDCD currently funds 33 institutional training grants at institutions around the country related to our scientific mission areas. Then there are the Career Development, or K Awards, and these two come in different flavors. There are the Mentored Junior Clinician Scientist Awards, the K08 for basic research, the K23 for patient-oriented <coughs> or clinical research. There is a very unique mechanism that is a dual-phase Career Development Award called the K99R00. This is an early-stage Career Transition Award its official name is Pathways to, Ind uh, to Independence Award, and this provides uh, a year or two of postdoctoral mentored support for a fairly seasoned postdoc uh, and uh, a um, two to three year period of independent research career award, uh, excuse me, of a uh, uh, of, of research award for an independent, newly uh, appointed faculty member. Uh, this is a very special mechanism that, that is a fairly complex mechanism at that uh, and is primarily uh, for um, postdoctoral fellows that have had two to three years of experience, but now in today's NIH, less than four years of experience, uh, who want to compete for a 
often hotly contested faculty positions, um, in, in most, uh, most frequently in the fundamental rather than the clinical sciences. Uh, there are <clears throat> other junior to mid-career uh, mentored research career development awards, uh, K01 and K25 are some of those special cases. NRSA program goals. Uh, these are the fellowships and the training grants. Obviously, we want to identify, nurture, support the most promising uh, individuals who are most likely to become independent scientists and facilitate them from the student to postdoc to independent career stages. Uh, there are three basic types of individual fellowships that the NIDCD uses, uh, and these are common to the other institutes in the main as well. The F30 is for pre-doctoral students who are in a dual degree, dual research and clinical doctoral degree program, most commonly in an MD-PhD program, though in recent years, we and some of the other NIH institutes have expanded to allow individuals in the non-medical health professions uh, in our case, most frequently AUD PhD students who are in a truly integrated dual degree program, i.e., where both doctoral degrees are conferred at the end of the process, uh, and it's it's integrated at all levels. This is a special fellowship to support those individuals. The F31 is your garden variety pre-doc fellowship for dissertation stage research. Uh, there is a generic F31 that applies to all. There is a diversity F31 that applies to students from underrepresented racial and, mani uh, uh, and ethnic minority groups, students with disabilities, and from disadvantaged economic backgrounds. And the diversity F31 applies not only to dissertation stage or training, but can even be pre-dissertation as well, coursework stage. The F32 is your garden variety postdoctoral fellowship award. NRSA allows us to provide up to five years of support for pre-doctoral NRSAs, which can be expanded to six years in the case of dual degree uh, MD, PhD students and, and others in that dual track, uh, and up to three years of postdoctoral research uh, training support. There are constraints to, and requirements that applicants for the NRA and appointees to the NRSAs have. It's a full-time commitment with a recognition that few among us work only a 40-hour week, but that's the base requirement. Uh, you need to be a U.S. citizen or permanent resident. Uh, the NRSAs provide stipend, partial tuition support, self or family health insurance coverage, and a small institutional allowance. And I told you about the limitations in the aggregate number of years, pre-doc versus post-doc, right? And that, there it is. The current fiscal year 2014 stipend levels for post-docs are noted here. It's set at one level for pre-docs, regardless of your experience level. For post-docs, it modulates upward from 42K being the base up to 55K, uh, depending on your years of relevant postdoc experience, plus an institutional allowance. So, what are the review criteria for fellowship applications, your strength as a candidate and appropriateness, your sponsor, i.e. your mentor, the training of an environment at both at the laboratory and institutional, departmental and institutional level, the, merit, the scientific and technical merits of your training plan, your proposal, and of course, uh, training potential. Here's some, uh, some information on the historical background uh, of the NIDCD NRSA program and some of our underlying philosophy. Um, and again, this is representative of our institute, not necessarily the approach that other institutes have always taken. We, the NIDCD, consider the individual fellowship our primary vehicle for supporting dissertation stage pre-docs and postdoc, uh, postdocs among the PhD pool of scientists. Of course, MDs and, uh, and AUDs can have postdoctoral uh, support as well, but it's primarily geared towards the uh, 
PhD and post PhD sector. Our institutional training grant is our primary vehicle for pre dissertation PhD students, uh, new and recent postdocs who are not quite ready. They don't have enough grounding, enough experience to write a competitive F32 postdoc application for postdocs who may be transitioning from other fields of science into our own and for health professional trainees, be they MDs or clinical PhDs or other health professional doctoral degrees uh, who are involved in, in that training process uh, in a postdoc capacity who are, uh, whose training tracks are not fully compatible in most cases with writing an individual fellowship, for instance, medical residents uh, who get accepted on a research track in a clinical department that has a T32 program specifically for medical residents uh, would be an example of where the T32 program is, is critical. There are other examples as well. And I told you about, through a wonderful partnership that we've enjoyed at the NIDCD between our scientific review branch and our division of scientific programs, have been able to, since 2001, expedite uh, the process of the institute-based fellowship review uh, so that we can make earlier funding decisions and applicants who are not funded but are given encouragement to revise and resubmit can do so readily and often without skipping a review round. So here are our fellowship success rates over the recent years. Notice how, column and your right, uh, submitted versus awarded, and the success rate is the ratio of those two. Uh, for FY13, we, the NIDCD, have held at a success rate of just over 40%. Uh, this is better than the overall NIH of 27%. Of course, it's going to be variable across individual institutes, but I can tell you that our success rate for fellowships is among the highest at the NIH, which we're happy about. Uh, specifically, the postdoc fellowship, or F32, has uh, even least this last year, a higher success rate of about 48 percent. Uh, we've been maintaining around 40 to 50 percent in selected years, although for reasons we still don't understand in 2012, we took a nosedive dip. Um, so it's difficult to speak about trends over the last few years. Uh, so this is going to be variable. Bottom line is send us your meritorious F32 applications if you are a strong candidate. We can frankly fund more of them, even within all the funding constraints we live with than we're currently funding. So that's my motivational message of encouragement. Success rate is very encouraging. Uh, this is, uh, I direct you to the bottom two lines here specifically, uh, just a quick comparison of the outcomes of our individual F32 uh, funded awardees in recent years versus our T32 postdocs. Notice how uh, almost 50% of our F32s have applied for uh, subsequent support in the form of an R3, an R15, which is an area grant, which we'll touch on ever so briefly, and an R29 no longer exists, uh, was kind of a specialty form of the R01, and an R01. Uh, of, the, uh, of those who applied, notice that 70% were awarded uh, for an overall award rate from our F32 awardees of a subsequent research grant of 33%. A third of them got funded, uh, as opposed to about half that uh, looking at the success rate of our institutional T32 awardees. Of course, there are hybrids here. So we have uh, many T32 trainees that have also, also gone on to their own fellowships. So this is just looking at those who are, you know, either one mechanism versus the other, but there are certainly hybrids in there. Uh, this shows you RPGs, or Research Project Grant Awards, of our NIDCD F32 awardees uh, divided across RO3s, which is a very popular mechanism, RO1s, uh, versus some of those, those other mechanisms. 
This makes the point that training histories of NIDCD, recent NIDCD early stage investigators are quite variable. Uh, it is interesting that over 20 percent of these folks have had a prior F32 award uh, and a similar number, a fellowship appointment. Uh, just over 40 percent have had a prior RO3. That tells you something about the RO3. Uh, and indeed, a third of them have had no prior uh, NIH award or postdoc T32 traineeship. So there's not one path for all. There is a lot of room for individual expression. Okay. Uh, aware of the time and that I probably better pick up some, some velocity here. Uh, in 2012, we did a training workshop uh, and um, uh, to assess our priorities and walk away with some outcomes. Uh, and we walked away with a very strong message that the F-32 is worth capitalizing on. It's very facilitative of launching an R01 follow-up, uh, and we want to augment our F-32 portfolio. Now switching gears to our Mentored Clinician Scientist Awards, of which a number of you are, are quite interested. This is to take a junior uh, level uh, faculty member in typically a clinical department who's had some substantive research experience, generally at least two years of some prior research experience and training, going back even as early as undergraduate days. These are folks who have had some publication output, uh, are hired into a clinical department with the expectation that they are going to be clinician scientists. Ideally, they're seeking to integrate clinical practice and research in a dual-track careers. These are generous awards in our institute and in a few of the other NIH institutes as well. Uh, we provide up to 105000 per year in salary contribution, uh, which is a substantive contribution. So for PhDs who are not earning at that level, we provide your full salary support. Uh, we also provide up to $80,000 per year in research course, uh, higher than most of the NIH institutes are providing. Uh, in return, we expect 75 percent minimum uh, protected time uh, for research for three, four, and generally five years uh, of experience, uh, of, of a funded period. So this is a, a heavy-duty, prestigious, high-demand award uh, that we invest heavily in because we found it to be efficacious to launch uh, independent clinician scientists. There are two flavors, as we've touched on briefly. The KO-8 is for cl clinically trained individuals who are going on a basic research track, and the K-23 is for the same type of person who is going into clinical or patient-oriented research, and there's your definition. The K-99, as I touched on earlier, is a complex dual-track award meant primarily for very highly trained postdocs who are within four years of research experience who can build a compelling case for the need and the value of an additional year or two of postdoc research training to cap off their postdoc experience and become uh, significantly competitive to be able to land uh, a tenure-track faculty position in, in the right place. Uh, this is the only NIHK award that does not require U.S. citizenship or permanent residency, uh, and indeed is applicable to our intramural program fellows as well. The NIDCD R03, or small grant, has gotten a lot of attention and enthusiasm uh, over recent years. This is different than the NIH-wide, uh, what we call the parent R03. It's to support small-scale research projects of transitioning postdocs and uh, recent uh, faculty members, you do need to be within seven years of your terminal doctoral degree, less years of clinical training to be eligible for the uh, NIDCD R03. This is a wonderful uh, launch for a full-scale R01 to provide that type of published preliminary data. 
Uh, it's a shorter application. It provides 100,000 per year direct costs for up to three years. We review it within our institute's scientific review branch. Uh, it is not percentile, but comes out with an impact priority score. Uh, and it's easily, in most cases, transferable across institutions if you move on. It's well suited to get experience with the NIH system to increase, uh, garner, and publish your preliminary data gearing up for an R01 submission. Uh, and it's ideal for postdocs who have passed the critical period of training but don't have a faculty position yet, and they're still in their mentor's research space. They don't have their own research um, space yet. And it's um, associated with a, fun, uh, a, a, a favorable success rate, as we touched on. As I mentioned, over 50% of our R03 PIs who apply for a subsequent R01 do win one, uh, as opposed to uh, somewhat lower uh, for new investigators without the benefit of that prior NIH funding. Okay? NIH definitions of an early stage investigator, or ESI, versus a new investigator. A new investigator has not yet had a substantial NIH grant, typically $100,000 per year or more. An early stage investigator is a new investigator who is within 10 years of completing their terminal doctoral degree, less years of clinical training. And the advantage of signing up at the front end, even before you put in an application, declaring yourself uh, in ESI in the NIH system, is you are uh, cordoned in a special group within an NIH study section and reviewed together with your peers, if you will, as opposed to more seasoned R01 investigators. The R01 is, of course, the prize in our system, the sizable uh, either single PI or dual multiple PI award for an independent research project. These are typically 250000 per year or more, up to 500000 in many cases. They can be less than two hundred and fifty k uh, as well. They're typically five-year awards. Uh, they're reviewed in the main in Center for Scientific Review, CSR, NIH convened study sections. You need sufficient and often published preliminary data to support your hypothesis and feasibility uh, if you're coming in as an investigative team to mount one of these applications successfully. Uh, almost finished. Um, there are some special purpose uh, research uh, project grant programs at the NIH. We touched ever so briefly on the area R15. This is the Academic Research Enhancement Award. This really depends on your institution. If you come from a small, typically predominantly undergraduate teaching institution that has limited federal funding uh, within it, uh, you are you, you can be declared eligible for this award. depends on your institution. These are smaller scale three-year uh, awards for 300000 uh, and they offer both research support and mentoring support, uh, training support for undergraduate research experiences. Uh, our R21 Exploratory Developmental Grant allows investigators to pursue a really novel idea that may be high impact, may be paradigm shifting, but has limited gr grounding in prior literature. Uh, it may be high impact, but it often is somewhat high risk. Uh, you need to demonstrate feasibility, but strictly speaking, you don't need conventional uh, preliminary data beyond showing feasibility. It is most appropriate for proven R01 level investigators. We generally do not recommend this as your port of entry, as your first NIH uh, research grant. It's not well suited in most cases to early stage investigators. Prove yourself with an R01 record, and then this is your wish list type of grant for a project that you would like to spin off to, but it's not your primary source of support in most cases. I need to say something about the NIH Loan Repayment Program, or LRP, uh, which comes in two flavors for most of our institutes the Clinical Research LRP and the pediatric LRP. 
Uh, this is to enable U.S. citizens and permanent residents who hold doctoral degrees and are engaged in either clinical research or pediatric research uh, help them to repay their educational debt. Uh, so th these are awards made specifically to the lending institution uh, under contract. Uh, they provide typically uh, two years of, of, su uh, of support. They can be renewed. There are some eligibility guidelines there, uh, typically providing up to 35000 per year plus taxes for up to two years renewable. Our success rate at the NIDCD is frankly among the lowest at the NIH. We do not give this program the priority uh, that we give to our other programs because these are not necessarily to NIH-funded researchers or uh, individuals who will compete successfully, but rather to facilitate a pipeline for people in clinical research and patient-oriented research. And frankly, the efficacy and outcomes of the program are still unproven. Uh, but it is available, and it's a very useful program. We have had clinician investigators, particularly in our otolaryngology sector and audiology sector, uh, who have used this to great advantage. And my final message is please contact us. I've listed uh, some of our, our program contacts. Uh, my name is the training officer, our R03 coordinator, uh, Amy Donahue from our Hearing and Balance uh, Research Program. She coordinates it. will be here for the lunchtime session, uh, as will um, Dr. Lana Shechem, who, uh, who's the, uh, who directs our voice and speech program, uh, Judith Cooper, uh, our division director. Judith, can you just raise your hand? Most folks know her. And Dr. Cooper, uh, in addition to being our division director, also directs our um, language program and is indeed the deputy director uh, of the institute, uh, uh, as well as uh, we will be joined by Dr. Lisa Freund. Uh, Lisa, are you here? Um, no, not yet. Uh, Lisa will be here soon. She is our colleague from the NICHD and branch chief of child uh, development, uh, child development and behavior branch, and the staff who are already here. I also wanted to introduce our, our chief of scientific review, Dr. Melissa Stick. Melissa, if you could just raise your hand, please. Yeah, and uh, a new uh, staff member, uh, scientific review officer, Dr. Uh, Eliane Lazar Wesley joins us uh, uh, for her first Lessons for Success meeting, has just joined our, our branch within the last few weeks. And other uh, NIDC staff will, will be coming shortly. So, did I leave 10 minutes for questions? I think I left 12 minutes. That must be a record for me. So we'll take some questions, and I'll depend on my staff colleagues to help. Hi. Um, could you elaborate? elaborate a little bit more about the K01 and K K25 award? Sure. Uh, the K01 is for junior and mid-career uh, level investigators and uh, used by a few of the NIH institutes. We, the NIDCD, use this for primarily for uh, basic scientists who are um, involved in fundamental research and are moving into clinical research or translational research within our disciplines. So this could apply to a cognitive or developmental psychologist who's moving into patient-oriented research, for instance, in, in language disorders. We also use it for mid-career clinically trained individuals who are beyond appropriateness and eligibility for our junior-level K08 and K23 awards. Uh, to uh, receive mentored research training, although, frankly, in the latter group, we haven't had any takers uh, for that. So they're primarily uh, individuals who may be trained in other disciplines or may be very basic science individuals who are moving in a translational and clinical trajectory. Uh, and it also provides three to five years of support. Our K-25 is for quantitative scientists uh, often engineers, mathematicians, computer scientists who have not had an established record or any significant record of health-related research who are moving 
from those, if you will, tool areas or quantitative areas mm -hmm. into health-related research. Uh, yes, Judith, do you have something to add? Um, okay, so for the RO3, the small grant, we've had a recent change about eligibility. If you had a baby, if you had a taking care of parents, and it sort of delayed your research trajectory, uh, talk to program staff uh, afterwards because uh, we've made a little bit of a broadening of uh, those seven years. Uh, with regard to the Ks that Dan talked about, the career development, um, uh, sometimes you folks have trouble finding a mentor at your own university. We've just recently changed that so that maybe you can do something uh, Skyping your mentor, doing something a little more modern as well as maybe having an in-house mentor too. So that's changed, and you may want to talk to Dan about that. And then the third thing was about loan repayment. In 2012, 2013, we did have very dismal success rate. I know for a fact that success rate's going up. So if you haven't applied for the coming up next year's dollars, don't let those uh, percentages of success dissuade you from trying because I think it'll be better. Thank you. Thank you for those important additions and amendments to my comments. Okay, if I can just say that ESI is the uh, early stage investigators for the RO1s. If you have a similar sort of situation, you had to take care of a family member, you had a baby, and it, your uh, career trajectory kind of went off track for a little bit, there's also a committee that gives you a little bit of t extra time for an RO1 uh, submission that would allow, because that, that one's for 10 years. So if something happens in your 10 years of eligibility after you get your Ph.D., uh, you can appeal to the NIH, and uh, there's a committee that looks at those requests. See, that reinforces that it is a friendlier and gentler NIDCD and NIH overall. Okay. Thanks, Judith. Um, I know one of my colleagues had applied for the loan repayment um, in the recent couple of years, and, and many of our peers who are similarly at non-Research One institutions, the most common... Commonly, our teaching loads are 50%, which means that we have 40% research and 10% service, and it makes us ineligible for the loan repayment. So I was just wondering if there's any um, thought about uh, uh, either accommodations or, or any wiggle room in that kind of policy. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering. I, I, I used to coordinate the uh, LRP program, but over the last year or two, it's a colleague, Amy Donahue, who will be here again during the lunch breakout sessions, who coordinates that, but I'm, I'm wondering about whether teaching-related activities may, may go into the overall research commitment or not. That's something to take up with Amy uh, specifically. Uh, but there is that requirement of at least uh, 20 hours per week of health-related um, research uh, in addition to the fiscal requirements of the program. We get, we get a fair number of applicants for this program. It's not difficult for many to meet that requirement, although it does require planning in advance. And as Judith was on the more encouraging note, uh, if you put together uh, a strong application and have strong references, you, you've got a solid chance for this award. Uh, it, is in, it is reviewed uh, in somewhat of a streamlined process. You don't get a conventional summary statement. Uh, you're selected, and then a, uh, a fiscal survey is done to ensure that your indebtedness, what it is, and meet the requirements. And it's, it's a fairly friendly process um, and, and not a difficult application to put together. So it's wor well worth investigating. I also yes, have a Mark. question about uh, LRP, Dan. Uh, what about someone who has an AUD and who works as a research audiologist doing patient-related research, yes. who's a major collaborator, sometimes first author, but doesn't aim to be a PI? Are those people eligible? For They're that? eligible, yeah. You don't have to aim to be a PI or an NIH PI. Uh, you can be aiming to be a research collaborator, team scientist. Uh, really meant to try to make the, the research trajectory path more attractive to people at the front end when they're in the critical stage of planning their careers in these areas, pediatric research and uh, patient-oriented research. Thank you. I, I have a question about the K99R00 okay. mechanism. So the K99 seems pretty clear to me. That's the cap off of postdoctoral experience. Right. The R00, is that more like an RO3, or how should I look at what that part is for? Yeah. And applying for that, would I, 
am I thinking of two lines of research or is it, I guess, one continuous? That part's a little bit unclear. I think in terms of the overall research program from the postdoctoral period carrying forth naturally in a natural uh, genesis uh, and, and, and uh, unraveling, uh, uh, rolling out of a research plan over the next five years. Uh, the way you coordinate that out in an application, you've got an aggregate, let's say, of four to six specific research aims. They may have sub-aims under them, and you designate uh, a couple of those aims to be during the mentored period when you do need the mentorship both perhaps in new techniques and technologies and areas of science as well as the facilities and resources and guidance of your, your mentor. Uh, while once you strike it out on your own and open up your new lab, you're continuing that line of research to the next level in an independent laboratory. So it's really one continuum of, uh, uh, of, of a rolled out research program rather than two uh, discontinued, you know, phases that are, that are pieced together. Uh, bear in mind that the R00 phase uh, is administratively reviewed in the Institute after the initial peer review where you're looking into your crystal ball about what you're going to be doing three, four years sure. from now. Uh, so it doesn't have to be as well specified. But the purpose here is to try to facilitate the, most, the brightest and most promising investigators to get their foot in the door to get on the short list uh, of a tenure-track faculty position and hopefully win that position uh, with the help of a promissory note they pull out from their pocket showing that NIH will provide them with 249000 total cost, which is not a lot of money, per year for two to three years of their initial faculty position and thereby share the cost with the department in the startup package. And so the scope that of that help? would be somewhere between an RO3 and an RO1. I suppose kind of. you would have to okay. say that, okay. but it's kind of its, its, its own species, if you okay. will. Thank you. Right. Any other questions? Yes. On the K99R00, do I have to already have the tenure track position before I apply? This is a, an area of major problem uh, in our system. <laughs> in large measure, it relates to... Uh, not only timing, but, but integrity at, at both ends, at the applicant's end and at the funding institute's end. Bear in mind that the purpose of this award is to facilitate independent researchers uh, who need tenure-track faculty positions to get, to get launched. It is not intended to, um, you know, your walk-on-water postdoc who's already been promised and consummated a faculty appointment, often at the institution where they're doing a postdoc or maybe at another institution, uh, and the chair of that department or someone else is telling them, well, why don't you compete for a, an NIH K99 and R00, and this way, you know, you're much more attractive if you come to us with some support, but the position is yours. We do not make awards to individuals who we know, who inform us, uh, have, have won faculty positions. Uh, it is really intended for individuals who are at the critical search stage. So from when they get the award, they are searching for that coveted position, uh, but they don't have it in the bag, at least. It's not consummated such that the award is, it is meaningful. Now, the outcomes of this program, it's still fairly young, is not really known. All we really know from the NIH-wide data is it appears that these folks uh, get faculty positions faster <laughs> than, than those who don't. Indeed, I can tell you amongst basic scientists in the neurosciences, there are many departments that I've, I've heard from who won't even interview a candidate for a, a, a coveted tenure-track position if they don't have an NIH K99. So it's, this is not going to hit communication sciences and disorders, speech language pathology and audiology, otology and neurotology, etc. You know, clinical disciplines, this is not going to be hitting those individuals, but in those other communities, it's almost become the standard in highly competitive environments. Yeah. Oh, 
Oh, Dan, I just have a quick question. question. Thanks yeah. for presenting those uh, outcomes data. Those are great, and thanks for bringing those. Really interesting. And um, thanks. Chris. So I was wondering about the the T32 data. That was kind of shocking. The outcomes on the T32 versus the F32 data. And I'm wondering if uh, NIDCD is going to react to that in their funding levels for T32s, given that there there are quite a few you know aspiring yeah. and existing. Uh, T32 directors in here. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. You among them. Um, at least past, past T32 program directors. Um, a lot of people in the research community feel because of these kind of data and our overall experience and our emphasis on individual fellowships that we are going to compromise or vanquish uh, or move on from our T32 programs. We will not uh, as long as, at least in the foreseeable future be, because of other information I presented, we really feel that uh, program-based training programs, uh, institutional training programs are very important for our newest doctoral students, our postdocs who come from other disciplines, uh, and our um, health professional uh, trainees. So we are keeping pretty much a, a, a steady funding level. At any point in time, we have 30 to 33 T32s around the country. They tend to be fairly small. Uh, almost a quarter, uh, almost a third of them are otolaryngology focused. Um, uh, others are speech language pathology uh, and, and more audiology focused. Uh, the majority are uh, serve the um, broader basic science community relating to our, uh, our mission area. So we're going to keep the T32s with us. And again, they interact and play well with individual fellowships such that we encourage, increasingly encourage, our T32 applicants and program directors. I'm dealing with that very hotly these days because our applications come in on May 25, as you may recall. So these are the folks who are contacting me as we speak. Uh, we encourage them to build in formal training plans to uh, move their trainees, pre-doc and post-doc, to nurture them and to guide them in writing successful F31s and F32s, and that's done increasingly in our T32s that are continuing to maintain funding or the couple that come new to us through the door that we actually can, can launch. So both of them have a, a role, and we're not going to fund one to the, you know, to, to the exclusion of the other. However, when the funding gets tight, uh, you can be sure that we're going to give particular emphasis to our F32s. Uh, do you have time for one more quick question and quick answer? Uh, thank you. So I just had a quick follow-up about the K99. Okay. So you described it as a kind of late-stage postdoctoral transition, right. but also something to kind of bring to the job market with. Yes. So I'm just kind of curious, like, the turn, lining these things up time course-wise, when, when should you be applying if that's something you want to have in hand when you're looking for faculty right. jobs? Generally, our guidance is for if you're doing a postdoctoral fellowship, uh, and most people in communication sciences and disorders, if they're doing a postdoc, are typically going to be limiting that to two, maybe at most three years. Under those circumstances, the K99 generally is not the program of choice. Uh, we, we would much more recommend the individual fellowship, the F32, uh, as your port of entry. Uh, to winning a faculty position or its equivalent in a non-academic environment and launching an R01. It's an efficacious approach. The, the K99 is meant primarily for more fundamental science type of PhD uh, postdocs who are, uh, are, who are poised and going to be in practice doing three to five years uh, of postdoctoral training such that they have to come in before four years of experience. That's a new NIH restriction. It used to be five years. But they're typically coming in during um, late in their second year and into the middle of their, their third year. Uh, so it's not as applicable to this community as if I was speaking at the Society for Neurosciences uh, in front of a, you know, a group of... Um, basic auditory physiologists, chemosensory neurobiologists who are, who are in basic science labs. Uh, and if, but there are going to be individual people, uh, including at least one individual coming to mind who Dr. Mario Swirsky um, mentored from this community 
who have successfully launched a K99 R00. There have been a few examples from the CSD community, but it's predominantly in the more basic science um, uh, domain where longer postdocs are, are pursued. But if you have individual scenario, talk to me during lunchtime, uh, and we'll, we'll sort it out for you. Thanks. Thank you, Dan. Okay. Thank you very much for your attention during that long presentation. Thank you.